You're listening to Making Conversations Count and I'm hoping that you've not stumbled across us, but rather that you've had one of those little red notifications telling you it's time for a new episode. Well, you're still in for a yet another treat as we bring you David Holland all the way from his home working environment in France. He didn't even offer me a glass of wine. But I flew in virtually, of course, with my microphone in hand, ready to ask him lots of questions about what he does, how he helps people by making conversations about co-piloting their business count. We have a shout up for startup tycoons who sent us a message on Instagram because they stumbled on our Instagram page and gave us a quick follow and was thrilled to discover that the page led them to the podcast show and listened to Brandon C. White. Their biggest takeaway from the episode was that it's important to take breaks in between working and building on your business. Not having a work-life balance can be detrimental as it can lead to burnout stress. Hear, hear, startup tycoons. We're so glad that you found us and continue to tune in every week. Now, let's get to that conversation with David, who, incidentally, does give a very special listener offer, but you'll get that at the end. I have, joining me from yet another country, I can put a pin in my map, (laughs) the fabulous co-pilot of business that is David Holland. What an introduction. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, it's fantastic to have you here joining us. I've been an avid reader of your posts for a long time on LinkedIn and love mm-hmm. your approach to the insights that you have for business. Mm-hmm. So I guess the place to start would be, how did you get into doing what you're doing now? Lynn and I, uh, we've been married forever. We've been together for over 40 years and we ended up running our own company in the UK based out of Birmingham and Telford. And it was a recruitment stroke warehousing stroke transport business all sort of mixed together. And it was going well, business was going fine. We were doing okay. And it's interesting. Everybody talks about business in terms of of sales and revenue and turnover and all this sort of thing. So Mm -hmm. our sales and revenue and turnover were really good. It was great, but we weren't enjoying it. The profit margins were tight. We owed a lot of money and we were working weekends and it was just not very nice. For a lot of people in business, they have this belief that business is all about sales and top line, whereas actually it's about lifestyle. I mean, adding value, absolutely, but enjoying the ride, keeping your sanity, family life and balance. And, and, you know, the revenue and the top line is a bit of a myth, actually, I think, to just focus on that. That's what we were doing. And that's where we not got it wrong, but we were sort of going down the same path. And we went out one Sunday just for, I think it was for for a lunch or something like this. And we rode down on a almost like a napkin, a bit of paper in the restaurant. What did we want life to look like? Because I I found, and for us as well, we knew what we didn't want. We didn't want to work weekends. We didn't want to do this. We didn't want to do that. But we didn't know what we did want, if that makes sense. We hadn't got the, we call it vision and goal and all this sort of thing. No, we didn't call it that back then. It was just what, what, what we're looking for. And we wrote it down. We wanted to be traveling internationally, working with great people, adding value, enjoying the ride, working three days a week, all this sort of thing, wrote it all down. And then literally, this is like 20 years ago, I was in the office, the transport office, and the fax came through and it said, we've seen you, we understand what you've been doing in your career, all this sort of thing. And we think you make a great business coach. And uh, because as a business coach, you can do this, this, and this. And it literally listed down a number of things that we'd written on our napkin. The napkin. It was really weird. It was a strange one. So in answer to your question, we jumped into a, we bought a franchise 20, uh, 19, 20 years ago because it just ticked the boxes that we, I had no idea what coaching was. I hadn't got a clue what we were letting ourselves in for, but it ticked these boxes. So I thought around lifestyle and enjoyment and contribution. So it was literally that but just by writing down on a napkin in a, I think it was a pub restaurant or something like that. And then we, we jumped in and bought a franchise. That's how we got started. Wow. And interesting, isn't it, that a lot of people get stuck with what you do want, that you started with what you don't want, because then it's much easier to see, isn't it, around, well, I don't want to be doing 
this and I don't want to be doing that. I think it's an easy list to write. Uh, I mean, if you say to people, what don't you like about your job, your business, your life, your career, they know that intuitively. But if you say to people, what do you want in the next five, 10, whatever it's going to be, they might live on a Caribbean island or retire. It's not true. They, they, actually, what they really want, they're not, I'm not really sure about it to a certain extent. They haven't given time to really think, which is a shame. So that was what we did. And we still do it now. We're still figuring out you know, what do we want, what's next, where are we going to go? But that was a big turning point, a big turning point for us. Would you say that the biggest mistake the businesses is make is they focus on achieving something, so something tangible. So when I get that car on the drive or when I get that house, the extra bedroom, those are things, aren't they? Yeah, stuff. You get the new car and nothing really changes. But if you get the car and you say, I'm going to take my wife on a drive, you know, across the Alps. Yeah. That's how it makes you feel achieving it because of what you put it to use for. It's a common theme. There's a danger of, of focusing on the stuff, the, you know, the accoutrements of life and the big fancy cars and that sort of thing. Nothing wrong with big fancy cars, you know, but, but it's the sort of the reason, the purpose we, we have them for, I think. Something we've noticed over here in France, we're, we're literally a little tiny village. There's about, I think about 400 people here and the biggest car in the village is a tractor. <laughs> That's it. That's, and the next one's a combine harvester. You know, and over in, in France, it is different. There's, there doesn't seem to be, as, as there is in the UK, and we lived in the US as well, in the US to a degree, there's this sort of badge envy or brand envy. So when it comes to cars, you've got to have the latest Mercedes or BMW or Porsche, whatever it is, and you can see this. And, and they're, they're fabulous cars, you know, they're great cars, but it's sort of the reasoning behind it. Over here, one of my one of my neighbours is a, a senior director in Germany, just across the border, and I think he drives a Peugeot. I think it's a one hundred and six. It's like it's, it's a wreck, but he doesn't care. It's that there's not. It's different. He has a fabulous lifestyle, but it's not to do with the, the sort of visibility. And that's something again. I think we've learned. You know, we got caught in that trap of buying stuff, the biggest TV and the whatever it was. And actually, that's not happiness. Doesn't lie in the in, in the size of your TV. I don't think. No, absolutely. And one of your brand messages, I mean, really, it is the name of the business, isn't it? It's results are also okay. Yeah. And this is where you, you know, going back in the conversation, you were saying, you know, everybody focuses on the sales and, and the top line. You've kind of take, you, you've kind of been able to blend that need that people feel that they've got to have to the results and say, actually, the, the results are less about it's a Hilton more about you. Yeah, it, it, I think one of the questions I, that I ask people when we first, because being a, as a business coach, and we work on, with people in the business and all this sort of thing, my view is that the business is there to grow and develop in order to support the lifestyle that you want and the contributions you want to make and the, you know, whatever you want to achieve. But for, I think for too many people, it's the other way around. They get, they build this business and it becomes all encompassing. It's their time, their passion, and it just you know, sucks them in. And then they can go to a, you know, a networking event and say, yeah, I've got a, you know, a 1 million business or a 2 million business, whatever you like to call it. And they may have the brand new Range Rover in the car park, but that's not what it's all about. It doesn't really matter. It's got to support the, yeah, what do you want to do with your life and contribution? You know, for example, we wanted to work three days a week. That was it. The business runs in three days a week. And, and it does, it works three days a week, which means we can travel, we can do other things, we can do projects. We're, this is a renovation project we're doing down here in France, you may have seen. And uh, this is the only bit of the place that's painted, so I can't show you anywhere else. But we couldn't do that. If we were working five, six days a week in the business, we couldn't do that. And this was part of our dream. So you know, the, the personal dream comes first and you build the business to satisfy the dream, not the other way around. No, I agree with that work to live, not live to work. Um, Absolutely. My husband sometimes says that back to me and I'm like, <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do, honestly, I do, I do, I work to live. This is something else, isn't it? The business owners get embroiled in the, it's my business and it's personal. And this has come up with previous, lots of previous guests that, mm -hmm. you know, switching off is really hard. So yeah. whilst you've got your time in the diary as three days a week, and stop you from thinking about it 
No, no, absolutely not. And then this is why it's so important to do something that we love doing. You're right. When I'm working with you know, clients and doing a workshop on there three days a week, when it comes to the Friday and when we're digging the garden or something, it doesn't mean we're not thinking about it. It's always there. And I, it's like a, we treat our business as a person, another entity, another person in the family. We talk to the business, we liaise with the business, we're thinking about them and as, as we go along. And that's absolutely fine. But that's why I think it's really important to choose something that you enjoy doing. We didn't enjoy running a transport recruitment business. It was just not, we weren't made for it. This, uh, we are, therefore, it's not a job, really. I would never say this to my clients, but I might do. But, you know, I, I sort of do this so I didn't get paid, actually. I do, we do that to, to run everything else. But I actually enjoy what I do. I enjoy speaking with people, supporting them and all that we do. And I don't mind if I think about it seven days a week. It's all part of the fun. So it's about finding your passion and what you're good at, what your natural ability is and going just going for it, isn't it? Really? Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Just, just stepping through and, and making it happen. Even when we didn't know what coaching was all about 20 years ago, we hoped, thought, believed it was the right thing. And it turns out it was, I mean, thank goodness. But you have to take a little bit of a risk. You, you know, leaving your career, your corporate path, whatever career you've been on into this, creating something for yourself. Even if you're running your own business, you want to change direction. It's a bit of a leap of faith, but uh, in principle, it's, it's worth it. Absolutely worth it. What sort of work do you do with clients? Because coaching, to me, I've been in business, you know, and been in my career for over 30 years, and no two coaches are ever the same. That is just purely because we're dealing with humans. And, and I think that as a coach, individuals lean into being themselves more. How does that help others? I think it's an interesting, it's a strange one because I think that the relationship that we have with the, the, the clients, it, it's, they're all different with all the variety of clients we have. And we've got clients, not all the time, but over the years we've had clients, I think it's 34 countries now from, you know, at the moment with Canada, the USA, Germany, the UK. And I've asked people, and I, I was genuinely intrigued, what is it? That, why do you work with us? And we come as a team. There's John, my son, works in the business as well. Why do you work with us? What, is, what, what do we do? You know, because I was, I have my view on it. And that's why I call, I use this term, the co-pilot, because a number of the customers, they said, look, you sit alongside us in the business. You're there as a sounding board. You advise, you guide, you coach, you kick if you need to, and you're there as a support. It's a, quite a, a multifaceted I suppose, relationship. And we have clients who've been with us for, gosh, 10 years, 12 years, and the relationship absolutely changes. And my role, is, is it coaching? Yes. Is it a bit of consulting? Yes. Is it an unreasonable friend? Yes. It, it's, it's all those things combined. Yeah. And it's... it's the but, badly but think, that you can't shake. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it changes as we go along. And it's difficult to... I think, I think the danger with in sort of the coaching world, and I've seen this, it's exploded in the last number of years, is that a lot of coaches have this perception or belief that everybody's broken and needs fixing. So, you know, you're damaged, you're broken, you can't do this, you can't do that. I need to fix you. I can help you out. And I've never found that to be the case. I've never found people are broken. They may want some help and support and ideas and a sounding board and, you know, somebody just to be on the journey with them. But I'm guaranteed none of the clients I work with are broken. I mean, my goodness, what, what a statement to make. So I think that's a danger of the coaching world. It tends to, you know, they tell you that you've got these limiting beliefs where you've got this. And people go, yeah, I'm, I perhaps I have. Yeah, you've got this condition, whatever it is. And then they give you a solution to that condition you didn't know you've got. That's not something I've subscribed to at all. Everybody we work with, I'm sure for, you, for yourself as well, they're bright, enthusiastic, engaging. They want to get on. They want to they have some fun in their business and build a lifestyle. And if I can add some direction and structure to that and some pointers and a bit of accountability as well, well, then that, that's where it comes from. But yeah, definitely not uh, not that people are all broken. No, and generally speaking, I find that the people are just frustrated. They've got just yes, exactly. something, haven't they? And I think this is kind of another thing. I can't call myself a coach or a mentor or a consultant or a trainer per se, because I'm all of those things, depending on the context of who I'm talking to. And this Absolutely. is where the conversations, you know, unravel the what it is that they need. And see if you agree with this statement is that okay, quite often the advice that people need is as obvious as the nose on their face, but they're not oh, absolutely. see it. And 
there's this mentality, I think, that why would I want to pay for something that I already know? Well, because yeah. you've gotten it. Exactly. That's right. Because you've hit it so well. <laughs> I, I had a message come through. This is literally a couple of weeks ago. And uh, a client, one of the things I'd like them to do, I think from their marketing and visibility perspective, is do a video, speak to camera, do a video, introduce themselves and put it up onto YouTube, LinkedIn, a two minute thing. And they did me a message back. And the message said, I'm no good at video and I can't do it. So I went back and said, I don't believe you, get on with it. <laughs> and, and that was it. And they, it's the only industry I know where you can actually talk to your clients like that, where it's quite, you know, a little bit, uh, but we know each other really well. And within two hours, he'd done the video, it was up, it was great, and away he went. And he said to me on the other conversation the week after, he said, I would never have done it if you hadn't have told me that you had that little bit of belief that I could do it, I wouldn't have done it. And you just, you gave me the kick, metaphorical kick that I needed. It's all of that. It's knowing when to have those conversations with people to, you know, nudge them, guide them, support them, you know, maybe a shoulder to cry on sometimes, whatever, whatever it is, the relationship changes. But you know, from time to time, it, it's more than, I say, just coaching. I think that's it. That's it. We do a lot of broader work than that. I think like yourself as well. It's that guidance, isn't it? It's like you're saying, if it was to not change, mm. Back something is not working. Yeah. It's either your guidance or they're not doing the work. It's about, I personally, I think it's about getting people engaged enough to want to do the work. Yeah. yeah. From, you know, it's, it's like the alcoholic wanting to give up booze, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They're ready. They're not going to. It doesn't matter how hard you try. I do find it absolutely fascinating, you know, how we can evolve with mm. you and the conversations that, that you probably are privy to that they wouldn't have with anybody else either. Oh, yeah. No, the, the people tell me, and, and obviously everything stays with me and I'm sure with you as well, there's absolute confidentiality. And people tell me all sorts of things and they need to either share or express or whatever it is. And whatever they say to me, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but it, it's fine. It, it, if it helps them move forwards or make a decision or make a choice and they want to get something off the chest or share something, then that's absolutely, absolutely fine. And you know, that happens not you know, every week, but from time to time, most of the clients will let me know what their fear is, where they came here from or whatever, there's something there they want to clear. And a number of times I, I've found that by me not me, but a, but and a third party person listening and acknowledging it is all he needs sometimes to make it okay to proceed and keep going. So we just enable us as well. I don't have to agree with them. I just need to be there to say, yep, I understand it. I see it. I get it, you know, and off we go. And, that, and that's enough just to express and share it sometimes enough for people. Going back to what you were saying there, David, I think it's right that sometimes just you can have the conversation with yourself. And we sort of said this a little bit before we came on air is that some people's come like pivotal moment conversations are with themselves. They're the hardest conversations to be truthful with yourself and where you are. But often you need somebody else as a sounding board so that you can stop that rumination. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because you can tie yourself up in knots, can't you, sometimes? Absolutely. And, and I think as well that the dialogue that we have with ourselves tends to be hypercritical and too negative compared to what it could be. So we tend to talk ourselves out of things rather than into them because we create this, you know, maybe it's negative or whatever it is, idea of the future. And then it's only when you share it with somebody else and they go, well, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's okay. Or whatever it is, we realize actually we were sort of lying to ourselves to a degree. Mm -hmm. And that's just the art of this, this sort of structured conversation. That's where it comes from. So, David, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm not asking for names or scenarios or anything, but is there one particular client that you go, that was a real proud moment because when they came, they really were going, they didn't believe that it was going to happen and then they got this and were like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yes. I think, let me think. The one would spring to mind, and again, it doesn't matter who they were, what country they were in, anything like that, obviously. But we've been working together for about, Oh, I, I let's say six months. And I had a phone call out of the blue and he said to me, look, he said, can we meet up, uh, have a separate conversation? I thought that's either really good or, or bad, whatever it's going to be. We met in this hotel lobby and he said to me, so I'm going to tell you something about myself 
that you're not going to like, and you won't want to be my coach anymore when I've told you. I was like, oh, crikey, okay. So I'm sort of bracing myself. Brace it. And he, he said, look, he said, I've been previously, you know, years ago, he'd been in prison uh, for a number of years. And when he came out of prison, he hadn't told his current partner about this. She didn't know he'd been in prison. He'd borrowed money from the banks and not declared that he'd been in prison, which apparently you have to do and all this sort of thing. Anyway, he told me all this story. And he said, after about you know 20 minutes, he said, so there you go. What do you think? And I can remember that instant thinking, what do you do with this? And what do you say? Where's the script? Where's the idea? And it just comes from our instinct. Yeah. And I, my, my response was, Oh, well, that's okay. I, I thought it was something, I thought it was something really important. He went, what do you mean important? I said, well, we can sort that out. That's just life. It happens to all of us. And, and he went, I mean, physically, he just sort of breathed out and relaxed. He went, really? He said, you're going to, you, you're still okay with me. You still like me. I said, well, I said, look, you know, you've had the journey. You've explained it to me. You've done what you've done, all this sort of thing. As far as I'm concerned, we, we've, you, you've moved on and you know, life is there for the taking. And he said to me afterwards that if that my response that was, you know, oh, I thought it was something important, you know, or, or it was worse than that, gave him the, the courage to go and speak to his wife and tell her, and she was fine about it. We had to go to the banks and explain to them. Two were fine, one wasn't, so we, we changed. We went through the whole process, but it was like a, a cleansing, if that's the right term for him. He hadn't, he couldn't tell people. He felt he could trust me, and he did. And because my response was, well, that's okay, it became okay for him as well. And that was, a. Uh, I remember the, I remember that we laughed about it afterwards. <laughs> I said, I thought you're going to tell me you're an axe murderer or something, you know, you're going to come after me. Yeah, but he was just, in the prison. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that, that doesn't matter. <laughs> that was, that was in prison. We're all right. But no, but he was really the, these points where you have this moment of authenticity or through power within a conversation and you don't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. I had no clue what to say. I knew it was coming. I was thinking about this for the 20 minutes he was talking, trying to think, wait, what do I do with this? And when he finished, and I just said, oh, well, that's it. Then I thought it was something important. I'm okay with that. And it really took the wind out of his sails, but he made it okay. That was one of the ones it's happened to a number of times, not all about going to prison, but when people have a situation in life, they want to share or get over and how I, we respond, I think is critical. And then uh, off you went to, you know, isn't it? Because you're carrying that baggage. Yeah. You know, that was his baggage. That was actually stopping him from. Absolutely. Really opening up and breathing into what life was going to offer him. So absolutely. Your response, he gauged was going to be everybody else's response too, to some. Degree. Yeah. What he was scared of. And I get it. I mean, I absolutely understand it was being judged and being less than because he got this backstory. Well, you know, we've all got backstories. I mean, I'm not quite like well, that. We've well, all got a backstory. No, no way, no. Exactly. We've all got baggage. We've all got stuff. And, and sometimes we need to you know, put the baggage down a bit and, and recognize it and move on from it. It's absolutely fine as well. And that was a, that's an extreme version, but that was a very you know, poignant conversation. But better to recognize it, have the conversation and, and, and move on from it than keep lugging it around all the time. I think we've, we've all got it in different degrees. And that was one of the conversations that, uh, yeah, cause we went, when I said that, he went quiet. He went silent for about 10 seconds, which is a long time. I can remember it. And he went, really, you're, you're okay with all this? I went, yeah, I'm absolutely fine with it. And it was as if the weight had been lifted off his shoulders. He really was. He's and, and other people were okay with it as well. You know, it was great. Yeah, carrying that suitcase around that was so heavy for so long. Yeah. And then yeah. probably he's put it down and he's still holding the handle. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so I can let go now. Yeah. I let yeah. go of that. That's absolutely so very liberating. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah. It doesn't really matter what you think you've got that you're carrying around. This is where conversation counts, isn't it? That yeah. you can have finding people that you can trust. And sometimes that's strangers who, you know, happened to me before, but yeah. somebody in a position that can help you move on. I did some work again, doesn't matter where they were from, with a very high powered lawyer. And, and she was in court fighting, you know, big corporates and QCs and silks, all this sort of thing. And I remember once as it happened, uh, on the day she was due to go into court, we met in the city for a coffee and um, just sort of chatting away to do. And then, and the, sort of the conversation turned and she looked at me and she said, I hope I don't get found out. I said, what do you mean found out? She said, 
my fear is I walk into that courtroom and the QC or wherever they've hired stands up and says, I know you, I know you're not supposed to be here. You're not good enough to be in this courtroom. And this was a, a whole thing to me. She scared the bejeepers out of me. She was a brilliant lawyer, you know, highly trained, highly qualified, very successful. But in her mind, she had this fear of yes. being found out. And, and then, you know, I mean, the term now would be, I suppose, imposter syndrome, all this sort of thing, and the labels being applied to it. But that appears a number of times for people as well, where they get to a level in their to a life and their career, and they feel that they're not worthy or able or ready or whatever they want to call it. And sometimes you're breaking through that ceiling or having that confidence boost. And I, and I said to her, I said, well, if I was in the court, I said, I said, I would not want to face you in a courtroom. <laughs> so you'd scare the bejeebus out of me. So off you go and do your thing. And it was just a little bit of a, a confidence boost. And she was absolutely fine. Of course she was fine. But these little sort of ghosts in our mind, they speak to us and undermine our confidence sometimes. And I, I, I genuinely, I think it happens to all of us. You know, it happens to me included, the, the whole thing. I'm not immune to these things. So th- these are the sort of conversations that I see can just you know, help people along. So when somebody says, what's coaching all about? Well, there you go. It's, it's a mix. It's a very wide range, as you were saying as well. It's not one size fits all, is it? It's what's going to work for the person seeking out the help. Absolutely. We're going to carry on that conversation in just a moment. But first... So, David, you've shared a couple of like conversations that you've had with clients, really, yeah. that has mattered for them. Quite fitting, then, for me to ask you to share the conversation that counted for you. This is, I'm going to go back now about 40 years. I left school at 15. I was going to go into the family firm, which was a green grocery business. And my dad had green grocery shops in and around Birmingham over in the, in the UK. And uh, they were being screwed by, it was when Carrefour was coming over. I don't know if you know, okay. Sun Coalfield, Minworth area it at all. Use- Massive, great Carrefour's plonk there. And my dad, my dad used to call his flagship store. Flagship store was in a place called Water Orton, a little sort of village on the outskirts. It was about two minutes away. Anyway, the business was sort of being crushed slowly. And he said to me, look, you know, the business isn't going to support you. You need to go and get a career or something, which is a bit of a shock. And I ended up living in London. I had a, um, an apprenticeship, an engineering apprenticeship, but I couldn't afford the rent. I couldn't afford the food and the heating, all this sort of thing. And I ended up literally during the winter, this was back in 1980, I suppose. I was literally sleeping on trains because they were warm and eating at charity food shelters in the East End of London. And I wasn't only homeless, but I was pretty, you know, I was, yeah, it, it wasn't great. And I remember that the conversation, I got onto a train going into London because to Liverpool Street Station from a place called Ponders End in the east of London. And the reason I do that, I get on the train, go into London, and that train, the last train in, became the first train out in the morning. And in the winter, they left the heating on so I could stay on the train and sleep on it and then go out in the morning. Get on the train going into London late at night and a guy gets on the train in a cubicle with me and he's all booted and suited and looks very, very smart. I haven't had a shower for a couple of days. I'm not looking great. He looks a bit nervous and he's under no threat from me at all. We strike up a bit of a conversation. And after about 10 minutes, I remember I said to him, he was relocating from, I think it was Leeds down to London. His company was relocating him, renting him a flat. His career was on the up, being promoted, all this sort of thing. And I said to him, I said, how do I get on that side of the carriage? How do I go from here to where you're sat? Because you're like, he's only about 25. I was only 17. How do I sit over there? And he literally was getting up to walk off the train. And all he said was, Opportunities are everywhere. All you've got to do is volunteer or you know, put your hand up, show up for an opportunity, get on with it and do a great job and the world will open up for you. And I thought, well, that's not much help to a 17-year-old kid on his way to a charity food shelter. But then within about a month, I was working with a place, thing called Royal Ordnance, which is not the military, it wasn't in the military, but we were providing weapons and logistics to the British military. So a lot of military guys working alongside us. And this guy walked into the workshop and he said, I'm looking for a volunteer. Well, of course, even you know, if, you, if you're ever working in a factory or, or the military, they tell you, you never volunteer for anything. Uh, anyway, so I put my hand up. I remember, remember what this guy had said. 
I put my hand up, walked forwards out the line and said, yeah, I'll volunteer. Got ribbed by everybody else in the group, of course, but volunteered for this thing. I was put onto a special project and it turns out that I'd been paying <laughs> emergency tax. And I, I didn't know about tax, those sort of things. So I, he immediately took me to the payroll center. We were paid in cash then uh, in little brown envelopes, got a tax rebate. So I got nearly 2,000 pounds in tax rebate, which is a huge amount of money. That's a life-changing amount of money. Took myself to a hotel, got scrubbed up, and you know, life was okay after that. But it taught me a lesson. And I think something that I've done um, and continue to do is look for opportunities and go for it. And just say yes, even if you're not sure how you're going to do it, what the rules are, what the plan is. If it's something that looks you know, engaging, just go for it. You'll figure it out on the way. And I think that was the pivotal conversation back in 1980 that sort of hopefully served me well over the last number of years. And it's been you know, how we've done from where we were through to US, to France, all this sort of thing. Most of it's just based on not being the highest qualified or the best, but I was one of the few people that volunteered and jumped into the opportunity and made it work. And I think that was one of the big changes for me was just saying, yep, I'll have a go at that and we'll figure it out. There's a lot to be learned from that. I mean, just this morning, my 13 year old was on FaceTime. They get ready for school with their yeah. friends together and they're chatting and friends a real big singer and I love hearing her singing in the morning there's just something yeah. joyous about it and I heard her saying to, to my daughter that she was a bit scared about something so I kind of stuck my nose in and went oh, what's she scared about she's scared because her granddad was a musician that's got an album and the voice coach has offered to help her and she's scared about doing it and I was like oh I think that's a great opportunity anyway I went and was you know as you are in the morning, you're from one room to the next, aren't you? Busy doing bits. Yeah. And as the morning went on, I then heard her saying, oh, I'm a bit worried about my DV. And they're just starting doing their runs DV. And her friend said, I'm worried about that. And I thought, oh, gosh, this girl's worried about everything. Exactly. <laughs> and a penny in my mind just dropped. So I stuck my nose in front of the, the laptop screen and went, what are you doing for your DV for volunteering? And she said, yeah. Oh, I think I might just go and work in a charity shop for an hour a week or something. And I said, what about going to a care home and offering to do a sing along and you can pick some music with the voice coach that you've never done before. Yeah. And then you've got an audience that will join in. Absolutely. Yes. So straight away, she wasn't worried about the voice coach anymore. She knew exactly yeah. how to use that opportunity. We know somebody who's an entertainer at a local care home. One of my best friends' is granddad's there. So right. we've really put the pressure on. And you just go, well, there's an opportunity that's opened up. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. earwigging is not always a bad thing. No, exactly right. Mm. No, that there are more opportunities out there for all of us, who are professional, personal, uh, otherwise, than, than we know. But we tend, I think, uh, we tend to talk ourselves out of it or we pretend they don't exist. I remember I had a conversation with somebody about a coaching program. But she said, before we start, she said, I'm nervous about working with you as, my, as a coach because she said, we might figure out that I'm not the person to do the job that I need to do. It's like, wow, what sort of, you know, where's that come from? And she was, she was great, but it's really, she was scared of, of having a coach because she was scared of discovering she wasn't as good as she hoped she was, if that makes sense. It's really yeah. strange. And if you're 13 and you're worrying yeah, that, that your granddad is going to find out that you're not as good at thinking as... As you sound, yeah. in that nurse in itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But also, if you're not the person that's going to be best suited for that job, while you're on that journey, you will discover the things that you do love and want to work for. So it's a bit about being open for that, because why would you not want to have the best life? Exactly right. We're driving over to the Ukraine border next week. We were taking, a, we've got a convoy going. Yes, I saw that. But, yeah, fantastic. And it, it started off, we had an idea where, about three weeks ago, jumping in the hatchback and taking some nappies across to Poland to do something. And as soon as we said we were doing it, it's been amazing. The number of people have said that they want to be involved and they want to help and they want to guide. And now we've got, I think, 10 vehicles. We've got corporate sponsorship. We've got, you know, it's amazing. And but the, all the people we've gathered around us are those that just, they're just going, yeah, we're going to go for it. We'll figure it out. Nobody cares where they're going to stay, where the hotels are. They're not interested. And this is where we snowball behind things that we're passionate about. Yeah. Because it's exactly. what we can do. And, and also, I think we gather people around us that have a similar vision 
and uh, an ideology as well. We've got 20, oh, Lynn's doing all this, 20 people now, 10 vehicles, two drivers per van, all this sort of thing. We've got translators, we've got people in Poland helping us. And one guy wanted to volunteer, which was great. And he sent me a message. He said something like, what, under what jurisdiction are we traveling over there? What's the insurance conditions? What's the legislation? What's the border crossing protocols and this sort of thing? And he was like, I've no idea. There's a war on, for goodness sake, you know, we're going to get people out. We're taking stuff in, we're bringing people out. And that's it. He's so concerned about breaking a rule or a regulation. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're not, we're, we're okay. But it's like, really, if you're thinking like that, you talk yourself out of it all the time. Yeah. You never do anything because you'll just sit there going, yeah, I didn't do this. And I think you know, regret is much higher fear for me than the, the fear of failure or falling over sometime. It's been absolutely joyous. Goodness, one subject matters we've covered all at the heart of conversation. I'm absolutely, absolutely. In terms of listeners, I always encourage them to carry on the conversation. Where is the best place for them to find you if they want to reach out to you? Probably uh, LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, I'm all over LinkedIn. It's David Holland MBA. I use the MBA because there's lots of David Hollands out there, that's all. So David Holland MBA on LinkedIn. Uh, of Facebook, and you can find the website if you choose, resultsrollsok.com. And anybody's welcome to join, have a conversation, have a chat, and come to Ukraine board if they'd like to. <laughs> Thank you. So much for your time today. My pleasure. Great speaking with you. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Not only does David help to transform people's business lives, but he also keys into the fact that conversations count. That chap that was really scared about telling his past story about being in prison. Do you know? Wonderful. No judgment from David. And it led to him being able to go and change his life for the better. That's a big Wendy Woo round of applause from me. But wait, there's more. Next week, we are joined by Girl Fun Moment. Marcus Sheridan, author of They Ask You Answer, known as The Poor Guy, and he's going to give us a little mini masterclass. I want you to tell me in one sentence, who is your company not a good fit for? And if they struggle, it means they have an identity problem and their messaging, I can guarantee you, suffers because of it. You're not going to want to miss it. Please follow the show on the app that you like best to listen to your podcasts. And if you please just drop us a review because that tells other people that it's worth listening to the show. Mm-hmm.